we will call this meeting to order at 7.02. Um, and we have no flag to say the, oh, thank you. <laughs> Tyler has presented the flag for us, so we will stand and say the pledge of allegiance. Okay, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, the holder's right there, so I'll get one for the room. Hi. Um, for people who have joined us online, if you're not a board member, um, or when you're not speaking, if you're making public comment, if you could um, turn off your camera, that would be great. But I will ask for an approval of the agenda. We have a motion. So moved. This is Liz. Thank you, Liz. A second. Sure. Thanks, Lynn. Um, are there any additions? I would like personally to add a discussion of of um, finishing up the goals work um, because we didn't put it on this agenda. But I don't think it requires another meeting. But I want to know, you know, how much time people think they need, and I would put that under other legal business if that's okay with everybody. Anything else? Do you want to check if the video folks can hear? Um, can the video folks hear us? I see lots see of hands up. up. Well, I'm assuming since Liz motioned. True. True. <laughs> True. Thank sure. you, BJ. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Um, then um, if everyone who is in favor of, of adopting the agenda would either raise their hand. I guess raising your hand is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Two. Okay. Looks like that is unanimous. Thank you. And now we will go toward public input and announcements. So we have a number of people who are um, signed up to speak. Um, one is Kara Fitzbeauchamp. Hi, Kara. If, are, are you, you have the floor. Yep. Um, just to, to make everybody aware, we have um, a three minute time period. And you'll be warned a couple, you know, maybe 15, 20 seconds before that period of time is up. So, could we go ahead. Them what? Identify okay. themselves. Yes. Just so that if you could identify yourself and the town that you um, there's a lot are of in, yet there are a lot of people that nobody knows the name of. Okay. So, sorry again, Kara. Go ahead. <laughs> All right. So I'm Kara. I'm in Shrewsbury, and my kids go to Mountain School. I just wanted to speak tonight to add my voice of appreciation for the staff and school board members who work hard to create safe, nourishing, and engaging and empowering learning environments for all our students. Um, to thrive in their school environment, it's essential for each student to have a sense of belonging and connectedness in their school. And unfortunately, it can be common for LGBTQ students to feel unsupported, unseen, and unsafe without specific policies and opportunities that affirm their identities or provide safe learning environments and pursue equity in our schools. And I just want to show that I'm grateful that our kids are in a district with school staff and board members who are committed to supporting all students and who understand the essential role of creating safe and thriving learning spaces for LGBTQ students. And to the staff and board members who work to create those opportunities and spaces to affirm LGBTQ students and make them feel that they belong, thank you for your dedicated and sometimes underappreciated work and to the students in our learning community who may not always feel seen or safe. I just want to say that you have so many neighbors who aren't always at these meetings, who love you, who believe in you, who think you're incredible as you are, and can't wait to see all your gifts shine in our community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kara. Um, Nan Dubin. Hi, I'm Nan Dubin from East Wallingford. And I really cannot top uh, what Kara said, but I can agree with it. I'm very grateful to this board for the hard work that you do for all of our students. And um, I just really felt like I needed to come on tonight to let you know how appreciated you are by so many of us. Thank you. Thank you, Ned. Um, Gretchen Gould. Hi, I just wanted to call in support of uh, Mill River's app for sharing any resources to families um, regarding LGBTQ um, stuff. And I heard that there are some community members who are against it, but I just wanted to say students, staff, and families should not have to filter 
the information they can give or receive through someone else's discomfort. Um, it's helpful to share resources with families and the families can choose to access them or not. So thank you so much. And Gretchen, could you identify yourself in your town before you sign off? Oh yeah, I'm Gretchen Gould and I'm at Shrewsbury Mountain. Well, my kids are at Shrewsbury Mountain School in Mill River. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Davis Terrell. Hi, uh, my name is Davis Terrell, and I live in Hi. Shrewsbury. I never get his name right. Um, I just want to start off by thanking the court for all the hard work. Uh, my comment is, uh, one of the jobs of our school district is to support parents in educating their own children, providing materials, providing a reading list to parents who would like to teach their children about diversity and perfectly reasonable, as each family has a chance, has a choice to do access them or not. Our world is filled with many different ideas and viewpoints. There's never any da anything dangerous about broadening one's knowledge and learning to think critically of disparate sources of information. Thank you. Thank you, Davis. Um, let's see, Morgan. Hi, I'm Morgan Over. I am a resident of Wallingford, Vermont, and uh, grew up in Shrewsbury, Vermont, and am a queer member of the community. I find it very uh, important that uh, children have a place that is safe to be where they can be who they are. Uh, I can see many people on the screen and in this room who supported Morgan to be Morgan. I hope that that continues and I would love to support that. Thank you, Morgan. Appreciate your comment. Um, Peg Sewell. Yeah. Peg, you're muted. Um, 
safe environment for them to learn and grow. Thank you. Thank you, Peg. Um, I'm not sure if it's Cassie or Casey Ahern. Right here. Oh, hi, you're a lot. Hi. Um, hi. I'm, <laughs> Sorry. I'm Cassie Ahern, and I live in Wallingford and have kids that go to school here. And I, I really um, would just like to echo the settlements that have been um, already spoken uh, the, for the support of this board and this building and the, and the people who care for the kids here. and. Um, support for the work that PEG does, which is needed and so very important. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we also had two comments that were submitted by email from people that couldn't come. Um, and I will read them. This one is from Sharon Winicky in Shrewsbury. Um, I believe that any attempt on bans on intellectual freedoms and the desire for information is an infringement and an inappropriate challenge on First Amendment rights. This very serious issue is not new, i.e. the 20,000 books burned by the fascist Nazis in Germany. But it is notable that the U.S. Supreme Court has upheld the ability for citizens and schools to see and read and to listen and to write about all sides of issues at their discretion. And yes, this means children in public schools. After all, this is why we go to school, to be educated about all sorts of diverse subjects and diverse people and cultures, and to learn about the world in general. I encourage the school board to lean on the backs of the many giants who came before us who fought to eliminate barriers to many, and many of these diverse ideas. Please vote to support our teachers and to support intellectual freedom and to protect our First Amendment rights for all people, young and old. Thank you. And then we also have a comment from Meadow Squire from Tinmouth. I am addressing the school board and I am here not just to represent myself but to be the voice for many. You may not see us at every meeting but we see you. We see how you listen. We see your consideration. We see your commitment to the values and mission of our schools. Each and every one of you is appreciated for your service to our community and your dedication to our students. Thank you for your perseverance. We see you, we need you, we value you. Um, thank you to both Sharon and, and Meadow. And that concludes public comment unless there is anyone else that forgot to sign up. I just have a quick question for the yes. board. Go ahead, Eric. My name is Eric Solsa, uh, and I'm a Rutland resident. It's just, I'm just wondering why the um, the public is addressing the school board and reminding that they really respect that the work that you're doing, but that um, that the um, that the uh, gay lesbian community transgender needs to be supported or continue to be. I'm not. Was that a question? Mm -hmm. it, no. it was a question, yes. Okay. It was a wonder why. Why are, Why do we... Why, why is the discussion centered around this today? What has happened in the community? That everyone is coming together to talk about this. Um, I guess, we, I mean, we're, we're done with public comment, so we're in the, the respond to the public, which we yeah. usually respond to each other, but, but, but oh. to the public. Um, and there was a, um, a post that... Can I that suggest that we hear from our equity coordinator? Sure. Yeah, I'll respond to that just to explain why this is an important subject for us to be paying attention to. That's fine, Maria. Thank you. <laughs> I obviously wasn't doing very well, but go ahead. Is there a... <coughs> yeah, the table there, Jody. Right there. Hi, guys. I'm Jody Stewart, Rock your equity director. Um, so, uh, this is an important um, thing every single day in our schools because we know we have kids that are underserved and are not getting all of their needs met and are not showing up every single day feeling fully seen, appreciated, and loved. So it's on the tongues of your school administrators and teachers on the daily. Um, the reason I believe it might be coming up right now is because um, we received unofficial word of a concern about a um, resource list that was put on a private parent Facebook group. Um, 
And so I, I'm assuming that in that community conversation on that private Facebook group, a lot of um, feelings about that resource list, um, which was meant to serve gender nonconforming and transgendered youth uh, parents who are seeking more information, that maybe that, that dialogue opened up some good conversation. Um, and so, you know, I want to thank everybody for that dialogue and for that support for this hard work. We do really care deeply in doing a better job every single day than the day before to support our LGBTQIA students. Um, we are working to learn so that we can do better. We're working um, as a staff, we're doing our own reading, we are talking to our kiddos. Um, if you are the parent of a gender nonconforming or transgender student in our schools or a student who would like to tell us how we can better serve you, um, I encourage you to reach out. My email is jruck at millriverschools.org. That's what I got. Thank you, Jody. Are there any other board members that, that have responses to any of the public comments? Um, thank you. I, I, just straight up thank you. Um, we've had a lot of conversations, but it's good to actually hear some appreciation and that the work we're doing is helpful. So. Um, I would like to echo that sentiment. I don't have really good words, and I'm afraid that my voice will falter and fail me. But thank you. Excellent, Sam. Are there any other board comments before we move on? Okay, I appreciate all the comments that, that people submitted and um, you were heard and, and appreciated. Thank you. And we will move on to approval of the minutes of 1117. If we could have a motion to. So moved. This is Liz. Thank you, Liz. Second. Lynn, thank you. Uh, okay. Are there any um, corrections or additions to the minutes as submitted? Hearing none, if I could see a show of hands, please, for approval of the minutes. One, two. I wasn't there, so. Oh, okay. Yes. So I. A reminder to um, to non-board members, if you could turn your cameras off just to make it simpler for people in the, in the room with the big screen. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, and Doug voted. I'm not going to vote yes or no. I was pretty much kept out of the board meeting that day and sitting okay. in that little table, so I'm going to abstain. Okay, I'm going to ask for abstentions in a sec. Okay, are there, there are people that are not in support of the minutes? That's a no. Are there abstentions? Okay, Matt and Doug. And anybody else? No. Okay, thank you. Now we have the student board member update. I think we see them over here. So yeah. Tyler. <laughs> okay. So I'd like to introduce to you uh, three of our students, two juniors and one senior. This is Sydney Moser, uh, junior, Lacey Lanfair, junior, and then Chris Burnett, who's a senior. Uh, they've all expressed interest in uh, becoming a student rep for the school board. And uh, I asked them to come tonight to see what uh, this is all about. Uh, we haven't uh, yet firmed up a process for how this might look after this meeting. Uh, I know, I, uh, Adrian, you did share an email with me of maybe saying we'd go with two and have, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, maybe someone who's remote or a reserve or something like that. Um, or maybe we just do all three, we see. Um, I want to see what their interest is after tonight's meeting. And then um, we'll go from there. Do you guys have any questions for us? Just gonna watch, awesome. listen. I think they're okay. I think they're taking it all in tonight. Okay, maybe at the end. All right, we yeah. don't usually get this much praise. It's very nice. So don't get used to it. Come to every wow. meeting, please. Every meeting. Yeah. Uh, Len, go ahead. Just a couple of suggestions. There's a a, a website, the Vermont School Board Association, that talks about um, um, the essential students work of, oh. being part of the school board, and it gives a lot of ideas of what they can look for and not what to expect um, if you want to google that or they want to google that I think that would be helpful and I would also suggest and, and I have I have no problem with all three of them being a part I think the more 
it makes it easier on all of them. Well, that's just my opinion. Can we plan, to, I, I haven't told them this yet, I was gonna tell them later today, but I do plan to debrief with you guys tomorrow morning, and we'll talk through things, uh, uh, through some scenarios, and uh, uh, what plan is to have some, something firmly in place for the next uh, board meeting, uh, December 15th. Great. And wow. before, um, if, if you have any more questions about the student rep, I do have one more thing I wanted to bring up, but I don't wanna jump ahead. Um, I, don't, I don't see any other questions, so go ahead. Okay, so I just wanted to uh, bring some attention. Uh, Kim and Mary asked me to present this today at the uh, board meeting for some of our students, student athletes who uh, received some honors uh, from the fall season. So uh, for football, Connor uh, Piccolo, uh, tight end, first team, and linebacker honorable mention and uh, represent Mill River in the North-South Classic football game. Uh, Anthony Cavallari, uh, quarterback, second team. He's also a MSJ student who plays for us from MSJ. Uh, Ross Badgley is a running back, honorable mention. Caleb Jepson, offensive lineman, honorable mention. Jerry McGee, offensive lineman, honorable mention. And defensive line, honorable mention. Adam Shum is a uh, punter, second team, and defensive back, honorable mention. And then Keegan Greeley, another uh, MSJ student, is defensive back, honorable mention. For soccer, Mallory Carlson and Tyler Corey made the Vermont Soccer Coaches Association All-State Team. Mallory Carlson, uh, Carlson, excuse me, made the first team uh, for SVL, so in Vermont League. Uh, Julia Deppert, Kyla Sheehy, Ali Usher, and Sierra Carey, honorable mention for the SVL. Tyler Corey was named Rutland Herald's Player of the Year. Uh, Tyler Corey was also the SVL first team. And he, Tyler was also selected for the Twin State game, which is being played in July of this coming summer. Then lastly, for cross country, Anika Heinz was named uh, Rutland Herald's uh, Player of the Year and Runner of the Year, or there's two, uh, and also first team for the SVL. And then Olivia Haley uh, was the first team SVL. And also the girls cross country team won the SVL, and that team is Anika Heinz, Olivia Haley, Faith Murray, and Willa Sayo. So really good, I mean. That's all great say, news. Uh, it, it's really cool to hear so many names doing so do, doing really awesome work so proud of them thank you for sharing that and thank Kim yep. for. okay um, moving along we have student support systems presentation part one yes so what we've got for you tonight is a presentation on the systems of student support that we have in the district this is the first of two so Jody Stewart Ruck, Coral Stone, and Deborah Gardner Bosch will be presenting. Coral and Deborah are virtual, so they'll probably be doing some screen sharing for their portions. And Jody obviously is with us, but maybe yes, not with us. With you, but it's their presentation. Yeah, Jody's with us, but Coral and Deborah are presenting. So, um, Deborah, Coral, we'll turn over to you and let you get started. All right. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, the format this evening is a little bit. We'll just a little bit. To slides and whatnot so um, I'm going to be doing my best to sort of be talking to you and trying to make eye contact with those of you that I can see. Um, I had a, I had prepared a more of a in-person presentation so I'm going to punt a little bit on some of that information this evening just to see you're aware. Um, one of the things that I um, have requested to, to come back to you and provide information about is the special education monitoring process. Um, it's it's very important that our board um, in, in our community just be aware of um, some of the requirements of that process and, and what it means. Um, so I'm just going to take a few minutes this evening to give you um, what I would call the very broad strokes <laughs> of that process because it is not possible to give you, you know, the level of detail that I wish I could in, in a, you know, a 10 or 15 minute um, presentation. So. Um, in earlier um, appearances that, that I've made um, the board, I have, I have spoken with you about um, this monitoring process that is happening for our district this year. Um, it's a very comprehensive process that really asks and requires of us to reflect um, very deeply on, on the outcomes that relate to how we are doing things and how we are practicing with regard to serving um, our students with disabilities. Although I will say that, that this year, the monitoring process is actually gonna, is, is gonna require us to even go a little bit deeper in terms of really looking at and reflecting on how we are serving all of, all of our students. Um, and what I mean by that is that 
you know, in years past, the, this monitoring process was really, really focused on the delivery of special education services. But as, as time has gone on and, and educational practice has evolved, um, you know, we've worked really, really hard as state education systems to develop um, this model that we've, we've worked with you on over the years called the multi-tiered systems of support. Um, and my, my colleague and my, my dear friend Deborah, um, she's, she's going to do some, some education with you on that piece in a little bit. So I'm not going to steal her thunder, except to just advise you that, that this process is going to be a lot more in-depth for us as the year goes on. Um, in terms of, of monitoring, um, our district will be required to submit you know, an intense amount of, of documentation and reflection around 17 different performance indicators. And I'm not going to name them all off. I don't think that does it justice to do that to you. Um, but there are 17 different areas that, um, that the states and the federal government are going to to sort of take a look at what we're doing and, and how well we, we are doing it. Um, and some of those indicators I have, I have maybe shared information with you previously, but some of them include things like our discipline procedures and practices. Um, another indicator is in what types of settings are we serving our students with disabilities? So are we, are we truly including them in inclusive and equitable classrooms? Um, are we disproportionately excluding students with disabilities? Are we disproportionately suspending any population of students? So we have to take a, a really, um, we have to take a really comprehensive um, look at at data that is really district wide and then sort of put that together and then have to reflect um, in an essay uh, about what we're seeing and what it tells us about our practice. Um, those are just a couple of the indicators. Then there are other indicators like how well are we serving our, um, our littlest children, so ages three, four, and five. How, how are we serving the population of children that are those smaller ages um, but that have disabilities and, and very different needs as well. So that's an indicator. Um, another indicator that we, I believe that our district has has always done a heck of a job with and will continue to do a heck of a job with um, but looks at graduation rates and dropout rates um, because obviously we know that outcomes for students that, that drop out or that don't finish their education program, those can be concerning trends. And so we have to look at, at those numbers and analyze them. Um, so again, you have, a, you have a really, really broad, broad, broad process um, of, of all these different areas that we are analyzing and working to sort out the data. Um, in terms of the reflective sort of process that, that is required through the monitoring, um, this is new this year, and I, I'm going to keep saying that, uh, number one, because I'm asking for your grace, um, we haven't used this monitoring sort of process before. Um, so it is something that folks like myself, directors, we're all learning it and, and trying to do our very best with it too, but also knowing that it's a challenging amount of of work to be able to, to do it and do it the way that is intended. So um, with regard to that, there is the special education piece of this, um, of course, which is relative specifically to our students who have IEPs or individual education plans. And with, with regard to that, we'll be looking at, hey, are we in compliance with timelines that we have to be in compliance with? Are we completing tasks that the federal government expects of us? Um, are we, you know, spending our funding the way that we're supposed to and things like that? And those are just sorts of standard things that, that people in my position think about an awful lot. But the part that I will say to the board that, that I actually find somewhat enjoyable, <laughs> it was a little weird to say, the part of this process that I'm actually finding somewhat enjoyable and, and rewarding is um, we are required 
this year to take a much deeper dive into looking at um, what constitutes adequate progress with regard to like IEP goals and things like that. And all of you know that, but you know, we've, we've got a lot of kids who, who have been out of school or, you know, that are still coming back from the school shutdown period. And, you know, the long-term impacts of school closures and COVID-related dynamics, we don't really know what the long-term impact is, except, whoa, it's here and we're grappling with it. Um, so to have a process in place this year where we're really trying to take a, a really deep and comprehensive look um, child by child at, at what progress looks like towards IEP goals has, has just been kind of a neat thing to be doing. Um, and ultimately all of that, um, that data is, is going to be compiled and it, it will be used to, to make a determination about how we're doing and what we might do or not do differently. Um, and then, you know, the last piece I will just say to the board, um, there have been different uh, variations of conversation around special education policy, um, and that has not been something that, that we really broached with this board. Um, typically, the understanding of policy is that if it's something that's in the law or the statute, we don't really have a policy on it. Um, but we're being pushed in our thinking a little bit this year um, that special education law and statute maybe should be in policy and so we're all kind of grappling with what that means and and what that looks like and how very different that is from from earlier trainings that we've all had around VSBA stuff and things like that so uh, it's very likely that at some point um, you know, within the next months, we might be having another conversation perhaps about areas we need to tighten up policy or something like that. But right now that's sort of a, that's a down the road thing. And, and that's something that we'll come to, I think, when the time is more appropriate. Right now, um, our focus is on um, exactly what my friend and colleague Jody um, indicated earlier. Our emphasis is really on serving all of our learners, um, meeting their needs the very best ways that we can with with whatever we need um, to do that. And so that's really where, where we're focusing right now in terms of, of looking at how we're doing around monitoring. Um, so Deborah's gonna talk to you a little bit about some of the more system um, that, that we're using around you know, intervention and, and um, particularly with regard to like literacy development, which has, has really become a, a big um, focus for us this year. But before she, um, before she steps in, I just wanna kind of shut up and see if there are questions for me. Um, again, I did have a slide prepared, but I just, just looking at the screen and, and folks that are on and off, I just not sure that's the best venue this evening to do that. So we might do that at another time. But So if there are questions, you're gonna have to to tell me because I'm not seeing everybody. I think, see Liz, there she goes. <laughs> I I have my not great headset on. So I just want to thank you, Coral, and thank Jody for, and thank really all of our district leaders and educators for the work that you do on behalf of all of our children every day. I am so grateful for, for all of you and for living in this community. Really heartfelt thanks. Um, Coral, I, I, I'm wondering, this is Adrian. when when you think you'll might be ready to, to give us a, I mean, you're, you've set up all sorts of things that we're gonna be waiting to hear about. Um. <laughs> yeah, I did do that, didn't I? You did. <laughs> uh, yeah, I did. Uh, no, um, so I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna our first submission, Adrian, on monitoring is due January 15th. Um, okay. Which seems far away, but uh, yeah, it's not. I, I realize that. So. Um, sometime probably, I would say by the end of January, um, we'll start the next round of conversation relating to the back half of monitoring because that's the, the big part. Okay. Thanks very much. I'll, I'm looking yeah. forward to it. Yeah. Does anybody else have comments? Okay. You can move through your... I, I'm not sure who's being handed off to. I, I'm uh, Deborah, hers will be way more riveting than mine, I can. <laughs> Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> so, I, 
am going to attempt to um, present my whole screen, so we'll see how well this works. Um, I won't be able to see you when I do this, so uh, somebody can hopefully uh, holler out if you're not seeing this. Looks okay. Like, oh, you're going to see this now? Yep, you're all good. Okay. So I am going to give an update about literacy and um, intervention. We are doing an awful lot of work this year in early literacy. And I think by this point, everybody knows that educators love acronyms. So this is, the newest uh, acronym is LNIC, which stands for an early literacy. And the NIC is a Network Improvement Community. We decided to join uh, this particular uh, group, Network uh, Improvement Community. Uh, it's being run as a joint effort between the Vermont Agency of Education and an organization called CCSSO, uh, which is Council of Chief State School Officers, and also a professor uh, that we have used for a, a lot of uh, in-house PD before, as far as like reading some of her stuff, Dr. Nell Duke out of the University of Michigan. There are only, I think, 23 other people, there are 23 people in the whole state that are doing this, and then there are a number of other states that are also involved. 11 of the people on the Vermont um, team come from our school district. It's really pretty um, incredible because it's a two and a half hour evening meeting a month that uh, people have committed to. And we have you know, two of our interventionists or reading specialists. We have two kindergarten teachers. We have three preschool teachers. Uh, we have uh, our, our um, early ed intervention para, Coral and myself and Maggie Haynes all taking part in this. Yeah. So I'm just briefly going to tell you a little bit about what it is we've done so far. So we were able to take some um, basic, basic baseline data for our preschool students, um, really looking at our four-year-olds. We had the preschool students were drawing something, you're asking them then to uh, orally generate a sentence about their drawing, and then asking them to write what they can, and, and then just getting some data about whether there are any letters involved, if they're just sort of random, maybe they write their name, or, uh, or maybe they can use some initial consonants. So you're getting a real variety of things. So you've got some kids who are really just still in a scribbling kind of stage. You've got kids who are doing, you know, drawing a few letters. Um, that one of the little ones on the top has an MF, and it was for my family. So the initial consonants were there, and then labeled, and you know, done to a kid who's writing, I am a dragon. So there, there's quite a variety. Then for kindergarten, we were looking at how well kids um, were doing. Coding, so that's reading, getting those standard CDC words, and then how well they could do with um, writing those same kinds of words. So, and the samples again for kindergarten. Well, so there's a lot, you know, a lot of difference what kids can do at the beginning of kindergarten. So our our broad aim for all of the states that are working together in this is that all pre-K and K students you know, will improve their foundational reading and writing skills. But we have some uh, two real specific aims. And one is that um, by the end of pre-K, that all pre-K students entering uh, kindergarten in our district would be able uh, to plausibly represent in writing the first sound in most words in a personally meaningful text, meaning in something that they're saying or generating. Um, and that by the end of kindergarten, they can all read and write the regular uh, CDC um, words. Anyway, uh, that project is really exciting and is taking an awful lot of our time. We also, Coral and I last spring, had not known that that Elmick was going to happen, and we had already uh, taken on another early literacy project that was called the Alpha project, <laughs> the Early Literacy Phonological Awareness Project, and that was a collaboration between Coral and Nancy Tarasa, who's been a long time um, SLP in our district, and Emma Weatherhawk, who um, is our early ed intervention para educator, has a background in, in speech, took some special trainings this summer, 
And that's something where we're providing some whole class phonological awareness activities and also some more uh, small group supports at those uh, Wallingford and um, Clarendon, because they're our larger schools. Um, Deborah, can I just jump in there real quick and just add, um, we've already brainstormed and talked, I mean, we're super excited about coming back to the board to, to talk more at another time, but I'll just say that in the meantime, um, the ELPA, the ELPA that she just described, that is an action research project um, that she and I entered into and secured federal grant funding to be able to carry out, and we are, um, we have largely committed to a two-year cycle, but that, that project allows us to like very, very carefully gather and study and interpret um, early literacy data from our preschool and kindergarten students. And so that's what that's what we are engaging in as part of our part of the research that we're doing. And really these two projects will end up coming together and um, supporting each other, but it definitely has um, has been a lot of early literacy focus. I'm going to talk a little bit about the last couple years. We've also had uh, literacy work groups that have uh, have been working. Uh, we initially were charged with doing some of the work around guaranteed and viable um, curriculum that involved identifying some of our priority um, performance indicators. So some of that work was um, done with ELA um, 712, and we're working on the ELA um, drafts. Uh, were, they actually were done for K-6 uh, last school year. Some of that process you may be familiar with, that guarantee, the idea of guaranteed and viable curriculum. You're sort of unpacking what the proficiencies are, um, and combining perhaps some of your performance indicators, for, uh, prioritizing which ones are most important, and in some cases even um, having some of them that you are not, uh, not going to necessarily um, assess. So this is what this would look like. So we we started by having our performance indicators, all of the ELA performance indicators listed out for every single grade, K-6. And we had uh, representatives from every school and every grade band. And so we would have discussions and we take the information back to their teams. We prioritize which were the you know high and medium priority standards then for the ones that were the targeted standards, they wrote essential learning targets. And we, we just started this fall going back in and um, looking at the how and when these would be assessed. This will end up giving us a, uh, a little better coordination across all our schools about what we're doing and, and when and how um, specifically we are um, assessing it. So those work groups also, um, we have just done some work with the common writing assessments. Those happen from K to 12, and that just uh, was due yesterday. So um, we are working tomorrow um, and to look through some of those uh, common writing assessments. Uh, we also are going to be looking at some of the what is actually being um, taught in uh, Louisiana Belize units, which are ways that often science and social studies is, is being integrated with some of our literacy work. So those curriculum maps are going to be um, revisited. The common writing assessment that was just given uh, was a simple prompt. And, you know, tell about a real life experience of yours or someone you know that fits one of these two titles. That was fun or that was no fun. And so what we end up doing with these, um, right now, because our schools are smaller, we don't have multiple teachers at the school anymore teaching the same grades and grade levels. And so by getting a common uh, writing assessment like this in fall and spring, it allows us to put together some packets of student work um, and that you know have happened in all four of the elementary schools or across different courses um, from 7 to 12 in the, in the high school and lets teachers you know, do some assessment and also have some real conversations about what they're seeing in it as trends and what they're noticing that other students do well um, at other schools. So I'm going to switch to talking a little bit about intervention right now. So another big component of our literacy work has been uh, our intervention team. We have four. Um, 
reading interventionists or ELA interventionists and one math interventionist. This has allowed us to have a full-time person left in each of the larger schools and split the second person between a mountain school and one of the larger schools. So five days a week, we're being able to um, offer um, intervention at Clarendon and um, Wallingford. Um, Tindon has only three days a week due to their schedule, bit, but uh, Shrewsbury has four days a week, and we also have um, a weekly meeting time. Uh, that particular component has been really powerful because it's given us the time to really look at data, to have discussions, um, and to do our own um, PLCs, uh, you know, where we are really studying and learning um, more together, looking at our own instructional practices. And it, it just in the last month, I've had two other area districts um, arrange meetings to talk with uh, me and to have me talk with people in their district about how intervention has worked here because uh, we really have had some uh, have had some really good successes with that. Uh, and we have protocols set up for how students are identified. We, so not only looking at some of our universal data, such as our Star 360, but also looking at some of the um, school-based, uh, classroom-based data, looking also at our Fontes and Canal, which is our reading programs uh, benchmark assessment system, looking at teacher uh, recommendations, all sorts of things. Um, we have a lot of progress monitoring built in. Uh, the ES he is a very important part of this, where students are, are brought there, parents are brought in, plans are made, measurable goals are written, um, and then they're being monitored every eight to 12 weeks um, at the ESMT level. So one of the things that we also do is at the end of each year, we analyze uh, all the data from uh, intervention. We have some of our ELA um, data, You'll see uh, students that were marked in green here in this little sample had made more than a year and a half to two years growth um, in the months they were in intervention. The yellow had made one to one and a half years growth, and the red had made less than a year's growth. One of the things that we find is that most students who don't make more than a year's growth um, are students who have high absentee rates. So you can see a couple of the ones that were marked in red there. You know, so if you look at first grade, you've got two of those students who made a year and a half to two years, one that made um, about a year and a half growth, and then one that didn't make the growth, and they had 20 absences. Um, and that's something that, that we see really impacts that way. We're also able to leverage our intervention team. They participate in field meetings and um, team meetings at the schools. There, they're members of our um, ESPs, our educational support teams. They help uh, with all of the classroom assessments that have to happen through our reading program. Uh, they're actively involved right now in our NIC. Uh, we do, you know, sometimes they're even leaned on. Just recently, we had a team who um, was leading a data, uh, a data analysis at one of the um, elementary schools. They go in and model lessons. Our, our math intervention, it works because we only have one math interventionist that relies on a lot of modeling and planning of support. <clears throat> it's more classroom instruction, but that also can happen. Like this year, we had to be flexible. We have a classroom in one of the schools that has had a teacher out on maternity leave, had a, you know, had a, um, a sub there, and we've really um, helped provide a lot of classroom instruction and planning. They also are an important piece of looking at some of the curriculum work um, that we've done and also with new programs. So as you can tell, we've been very busy in the literacy and intervention world, a lot of things to be excited about. And I'm gonna try to stop presenting here and see if I can see people again. Because for all I know, I've been talking to myself this whole time. Questions? I think you've overwhelmed us, Deborah. <laughs> With how many words I could fit into my 15 minutes? <laughs> well, I think Liz. Liz? 
Hi, Deborah. Thank you so much for that. So, um, my mom got her PhD in language literacy and learning while I was in college, which is very inspirational for me. And um, I don't know why I read the dissertation, but I did. Um, and so I know first, you know, I know through her research, but also the classroom teacher, the effects of phonological spelling on early, early ed students' literacy development. And yeah. so I just want to applaud you. I want to applaud all of the teachers involved in this. This is fantastic. Yes, Thank it's you. really been amazing in a time that teachers have so much else on their plate for people to be willing to put in the energy for this. So it has been terrific. It's a wonderful opportunity for our students. Thank you. It is. <laughs> Sure. Just a comment for the board and for the public. You know, the the reason we share these presentations with you is there are lots of distractions. There's a lot of noise. There's this minor global pandemic going on. We have community dynamics that we see, you experience as well, that can be very distracting. We have teachers, staff, support staff, leaders, board members who are exhausted. Everybody is doing their darndest to make sure that the operation keeps plugging ahead and to block out the noise. And the reason we share this information with you is we want you to see tangibly that we have folks in the system that work for you, that are dedicated, that are passionate, that are busting their tails in organized, deliberate ways that are paying dividends. Now, none of this stuff is magic. None of it changes anything overnight. But I happen to believe, and I think you do, because we talk about goals a lot, if you set a goal and you continually make moves toward that goal, you will get to that goal. And if we're playing the long game of making sure that we take this system of schools to the place that we all want it to go, it's these types of structures and systems that get us there with cons consistent and deliberate energy and support. And so we appreciate, number one, your support. I appreciate the folks that make these things happen, but there's a lot of people behind the scenes to do it as well. So I hope that's a takeaway that you have tonight, that the things are moving and they're moving in a good direction. Thank you both, Coral and, and Deborah. That that we look forward to the next the next installment. But it sounds like a tremendous amount of work is being done. Thank you. Um where are we? COVID. COVID dynamic up, or dynamics update. Yeah, so if you recall at the start of the school year, you know, we talked about, hey, we're going to be masked to a point that's undetermined and we'll see how things go. And we've all been seeing how things have been going. Um, it doesn't bring me any joy to say that we are in the most difficult COVID stretch that we've experienced here as a district. And we continue, I would say, to be more fortunate than other districts around us who have, who have had to navigate more. Just to give you some tangible things, we currently have 17, 1, 7 active cases in the district right now that have students out and staff out in different levels of, of quarantine. Um, some, in some of those cases, we have full classrooms that are quarantined. Those tend to be the elementary classrooms because of the time components of how an elementary class operates compared to classes here at Mill River where students are moving around more frequently, which means they're around each other for less duration. Uh, the challenge with our health services team is that they are working every day, all day, on managing COVID. So the, the normal work of a school health office, you know, if you think of skin knees and bumped elbows and, and headaches and whatnot, like that still gets addressed, but that is addressed secondary to the work of COVID, which involves keeping track of who's where, what's going on, contacting families, explaining the contact tracing, et cetera. So it's a significant, significant lift. A couple positive things to share. We have made some adjustments to our contact tracing process to try to be as streamlined and as efficient as possible so that we don't completely burn our nursing staff out because we are approaching that, that flex point that could become problematic. We are starting to um, access volunteers that have specific experiences. So as an example, um, I've been working with the Wallingford Rotary and identifying there are some former educators and former healthcare professionals in that group that meet some of the HIPAA and FERPA obligations that, that we need to utilize. And so we're going to be having some volunteers helping us out with the contact part of the contact tracing, not the tracing and decision making, but the communication side of things. 
And there's also even a, a resource that we're able to access through the state where a temp agency is providing us access to an individual or a couple individuals who may be able to help us out with some of the just administrative, you know, documentation stuff. Not, not the um, intense aspects of the contact tracing, but the, the time-consuming database aspects. I just want to thank our health team for everything they do. I want to thank our administrators because they play a key role in that. And I, I truly want to thank our, our parents when we have cases that pop up in the community. We are getting notified quickly. You know, we tend to find out before the Department of Health contacts us to tell us about it. And we end up sharing with the with VDH what we are seeing and, and what we're experiencing. If you asked me to project forward, um, I don't feel super encouraged right now. I feel like there is light in a tunnel that's a way out there. I think the variables that affect <laughs> us getting to that light are vaccine for the youngest kids running its course and getting to, uh, to levels that are, are helpful. Give you some tangible numbers. We just got our vaccination rate here in this building at Mill River, that's 57%, 5, 7. Uh, if you think about that target of 80, you know, we're still a ways off from that. That 57 has not been budging much recently, so we may be about capped out there. We had our second uh, vaccine clinics in our elementary schools at Clarendon and Wallingford yesterday and today. So we're seeing our younger students that are accessing that. Those numbers are going to start to come on board and we'll see the positive effects of that. And I think we've all heard that there are allegedly um, other treatments that the pharmaceutical companies are working on, you know, kind of along the lines of like a flu treatment, a, a COVID treatment, if you will, that may be helpful. There was a time that I was saying to myself, hey, by January, maybe we won't be in masks anymore and we'll be through this. I've scrapped that in my mind. Um, I've then told myself, well, maybe by March or so we might, you know, be, be there and through this. I'm kind of scrapping that in my mind. It feels like, not to be doomsday day, but it feels like this is going to be a full school year of this experience. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, this has become normal. You know, we've become acclimated to this in the school environment and we're operating and we're doing everything we can. So. I'll continue to keep you updated. I'm hoping that as we get through the holidays, we'll see those high case rates start to drop, but we all understand now how this works. And uh, this, this all has to run its course and, and work its way through. And we'll, we'll also keep our fingers crossed that the new variant or future variants, uh, you know, tend out to be 10, excuse me, end up being non-factors, you know, things that we don't have to worry about or deal with, but challenging times for sure. Any comments or questions in the COVID realm? Okay, we mind hearing from them. How's your day to day going? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We can't get rid of the masks, but <laughs> what are you seeing? Yeah, introduce yourself and your age and that kind of stuff, and you have something to say. Um, I'm Christopher Burnett. Uh, I'm from Wallingford, East Wallingford, Vermont, um, more specifically. <clears throat> I'm 18, and like Mr. Wiedemann said, I am a senior at Mill River. Um, been coming here since. I said seventh grade and all the way through up. Um, yeah. How's the mask? Uh, how's the COVID, dealing with COVID and being in school? Yeah. Um, from last year and going on this year, I have noticed that there are stricter and more teachers putting their foot down about it, which is great. I love it. But there are students who still completely disregard the fact that it's a problem. They still, they still wear the mask incorrectly, even below their chin, even when they are told to pull it up. Um, it's just annoying, honestly, to put it that way. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. I don't want to get shut down again. Need a remote. I'm Lacey. I'm a, I'm a junior. I've um, been in this district since preschool. I'm from Clarendon. Um, I think the COVID, I think how our teachers are handling COVID is really great and I appreciate them for that. Um, I, like Chris said, he couldn't have said it better. Um, kids are still disregarding the fact that we should be wearing our masks correctly, um, which is unfortunate, but I think we're all handling it like we can. And like I said, I greatly appreciate our teachers and staff that help hold that down. I'm Sydney Moser. I've been in this district for since kindergarten preschool I am a junior and they both said it really well I don't know how else to say it but I think I just it it's annoying honestly how teachers have to say 
put your mask up multiple times a day and the kids don't follow that. They wear it under their nose, under their chin, and um, yeah. So. Um, an add on that I was just thinking. Um, all, you know, all classrooms are safe, everyone's six feet, you know, um, but the lunch situation, that's for me probably the scariest time to be around people because the way it's set up, uh, different places for kids to eat, uh, people do have their masks off and everything, but there'll be times, and there's every, every day you'll see groups of people within six feet talking face to face about their masks. Uh, on and just thinking I don't know if it could be something that we could do but instead of eating in the auditorium and or lunch rooms maybe going back to the classrooms to eat because I feel like there's more space per classroom and most of the classes aren't big like they used to be kind of small uh, smaller beautiful man Chris, could I suggest, when Mr. Wiedemann said he was going to debrief with you folks tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Say that. Right. Say that loud and clear, right? <laughs> Let your voice be heard on that. All right. Yeah. Thank you. We appreciate it. Um, does anybody else have any comments on? Anybody on virtual? Okay. Um, we are actually going into a, a quick um, hybrid board meeting debrief just I guess to see do people think it's worth it you know working um, I don't know what else you wanted to to bring up with that yeah so th this was put on the agenda on the heels of you done the retreat a week or two ago in kind of a hybrid format um, but this is obviously our first one personal opinion the logistics have worked better than I imagined I don't know if other folks feel that way but uh, I'd be curious in the board's opinion in terms of moving forward as we enter these winter months do we land on this is the default board meeting format for a stretch just to give people flexibility and options or it's worth the conversation to decide what happens next maria the people who are remote yeah maria Thanks. go ahead yeah um um as someone who's been remote for the last two meetings including the retreat i really appreciate the option and i feel like i can hear people really well um sound quality is good. I can't see the people who are on site, but I know who you are. So <laughs> I think maybe come March, in the event that we have new board members, we might have to do a better job of, in, of people who are on site introducing themselves and letting people know who is speaking. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I feel like it functions really well and I do feel like I can take um, I can take part in the meeting, I can listen, I can hear everybody, and I can focus. I think it's really, um, it's really successful for my point of view. Thank you. Yes, Sasha? Uh, things are working well for me as well. Um, I can tell you that I, uh, today, for example, I really um, have appreciated this format, and I know I've just come back from Thanksgiving, uh, where I, uh, you know, we, we tested before we all convened, but I was at Thanksgiving in Massachusetts with my in-laws, and uh, I hadn't been around that many people in a while. So um, it was, it's been a good safety precaution for me as I await the results of my COVID test. I think I could be in good source, um, but just, just knowing that I can take that action to protect um, our fellow board members as well. Um, I'm really grateful for it. Um, I also appreciated seeing that members of the public um, did join uh, virtually for public comment. Um, I hope that the public will be continued if we do utilize this sort of model um, for you know whatever period of time here. Um, I hope that the public will continue to be encouraged to um, participate however uh, they are able. Um, I was, again, glad to see that people have utilized it. Thanks, Sasha. Liz? Hi, everybody. So I just, I like the option of being home. One, as a working parent, it makes my life a little less hectic. 
But also, uh, full disclosure, I am a classroom teacher. I had a close contact yesterday, right? I had a close contact right before Thanksgiving. I don't ever want to be a vector for a transmissible disease and, you know, infect one of my fellow board members or community members. So um, this is my way of doing my part to stop the transmission. So I just wanted to share that. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. We appreciate it. Um, I guess I have to make a comment in terms of being the chair. I have not tried to be remote because I really can't figure out how it would work. So I'll continue to be coming um, in person. I mean, re you know, depending on, on illness or whatever. But I mean, in terms of, of running the meeting, as long as I'm here, it hasn't been too bad. Um, everybody seems to be able to see what they want to say and can mostly tell who's voting on what. Although not always. But it is very helpful to have all the all the um, screens turned down except for the you know board members and those speaking that that's that's really helpful anybody else because we can um, I just want to yes. go over go some of the logistics that I understand about this um, one I made a mention of Brian like if we could have a second TV so I'm not twisting my head that actually would be kind of helpful mm -hmm. um, from what I understand for public we have the limited seats in here and an overflow in the library, is that how that works? Correct. Um, that, I think, is a great idea. I'm just hoping that that works out. And I don't want any of the public to realize that we just, <laughs> we like seeing you, we like you having it in the room, but sometimes there's more. Mm -hmm. um, what I don't know is if any, like if Brian said something right now, is it getting picked up or do public need to come up to the stand? I think mostly, but it's not going to be incredibly loud. It sounds great, actually. Um, like when there are eight lights in the room earlier. Okay, so even we so they don't necessarily have to. They can speak from where they're sitting. Um, what's the logistics for someone who might want to speak from the overflow? Our intention was to yeah. run and grab them. You run and grab them. <laughs> okay. When they sign up for comment, if they're in the other room, we we come in. Okay, I just want I just want that all out there. Um, I do like the format. I do like the option. I've done the two meetings we've had. I've been here, but I could be home too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. Anybody else? Because we'll move on otherwise. I don't see anybody raising their hands. Okay. Um, we have a bylaws review finally. <laughs> Yeah, so for our, for our audience, um, this might be a time that you get bored. Nobody will take any offense if you leave, but we, we have the exciting <laughs> period of bylaws review going on. Um, for board members, I'll share my screen with you. That's the wrong kind of share, sorry. this larger for good view. Slightly larger. Yeah, it's a little small. All right, so just a reminder to board members just to kind of give you some, some background. Uh, these are the bylaws that were created when the, the board first unified in 2016. There was a, an amendment made to the bylaws in 2018. And it had been suggested, I want to say, actually dating back to like the summertime, I think Len first brought up the thought that we needed to kind of dig in and find the things that didn't match anymore and didn't, didn't line up. Shared a proposal with the board that we just start chipping away at this. Um, that proposal takes us into early 2022 to possibly get to a point where you could vote on amended bylaws. But the, the theory at this point would be just an opportunity to work through a few sections. I had proposed a schedule to you uh, that included looking at sections one, two, and three this evening. And those sections, as you can see, are the purpose of the board, details about board membership and number of board members from each town, um, how those are calculated, 
And then the final section is a section about meetings and agenda. Uh, my suggestion to the board would be, um, I'm happy to facilitate this dialogue just to help keep it moving, but if you feel like you've had enough tonight, speak up and say we've had enough. You know, let's, let's redraw, this, redraw this game plan. So if, if there aren't any questions, um, it would probably make sense to start with... Dave, I have oh yeah, go ahead, Len, sorry. I'm sorry. Um, Look, just looking at the timeline. Yep. After organization and officer, it goes to treasurer and district treasury. Isn't and because I have to read, mm -hmm. I looked at there was E, and I didn't print it all out. That talks about committees. Under what heading? Well, it's not in the timeline. Is oh, it organization officers? No. A, B, C, D, D, E. Organization and officers. E is committees. Yeah, that's a part of organization and officers. It is. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Because if you keep going down it's further. It's just coming right through here. Okay, I'm yeah. fine. You eventually okay. get to Roman numeral five, which is treasurer and district okay. secretary. Yeah. We're good. Thank you. Cool. Sorry for people that are looking at the screen and getting cross eyed as I go back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> so the first section is the purpose of the board it probably just makes sense to just pause um, I've got roughly the first three paragraphs that are on screen and I'm happy to just take notes on the Google Doc that I'm working on just in terms of any recommended edits or strike throughs etc again none of this is board vote stuff this is just kind of the editing process to um, get us to a, a a point in the future when you would vote on possible changes. Is it worth um, putting in the, you know, in the actual body of the bylaws any amendment dates, rather than just having it as a headed a heading where it says amended on on October third, two thousand eighteen, where it says um, on the last line of the purpose, um, MRUUSD is governed by the articles as adopted on March first, two thousand sixteen. But I think that would be a good spot to also say and amended on October 3rd, and then if we do a further amendment, to have that listed in that spot so that there's no confusion, that, that those would be the most up-to-date bylaws. That makes sense to me. Does that make sense to the group, what I've just typed up there, and I put it in red just to indicate, like, hey, there's a new concept. Right. So keep me track of the original approval and then any subsequent amendment dates within the, yeah. the text. That's the only thing I saw in that one. Anyone else have any other thoughts on um, what's on the screen at this point, those first three paragraphs? I'm not sure if, if I can see everybody. Um, if, if you're not being called on and you have something to say, just pipe up. Doesn't look like there's any other comments okay. on that. Hey, we just got number one done. Way to go, everybody. <laughs> board membership number two. So I'll, we'll read the first line. The board shall consist of 11 members, directors, elected for three-year terms except for the initial board. Um, as we get into this next section, I think there are a couple things that you could consider. Um, one would be the reference to the initial board, right? And talking about those terms due to the fact that we these were written as we were approaching unification and now we're well past that. You could make a case for removing those references. Another uh, piece that you see I highlighted in letter B was just it felt important to make sure that we rechecked the census numbers to make sure that that proportion of four Clarendon, four Wallingford, two Shrewsbury, one Timoth was still appropriate. Um, you will notice that those numbers do still hold. What the census data is doing is somewhat interesting. If you look at 2010 versus 2020, Clarendon down 151 residents, that's 5.9 percent. Shrewsbury up 40, that's up 3.7 percent. Tinmouth down 60 residents, that's down 9.7. Wallingford up 53, which is up 2.5. And overall, for our four towns, that's down 118, the equivalent of 1.8%. But even with those adjustments, that ratio of 4, 4, 2, and 1 um, still holds. It still makes sense overall. But definitely wanted to make sure we were checking that data. <laughs> there anything I guess it does say that after every census we will do that doesn't it yes town representation okay. recalculated yeah. promptly following the oh, I love release. It. yeah that was a grant word I'm for about 10 years. 
So any thoughts on what we have in that kind of section A and B that are visible on screen? Any, any opinions? Please, Len. A question. The last sentence in that big paragraph there. In the letter B one? Yes. It, it said, and it, I'm not sure what it meant. It says, to the extent permitted by law, Clarendon and Wallingford shall continue to have equal representation. So now, does that mean that even if the census changes, <coughs> that they will remain at whatever the number is? They have to be the same? Yes. Our, our friend Grant, who was the guru of this, uh, um, mm -hmm. was responsible for that language, wisely so. I believe the situation is the statute requires that representation has to be proportional. Right. But realizing that Wallingford and Clarendon are going to not necessarily always align, as long as the law is not violated, they should be equal. Okay. I don't know where that threshold of where it wouldn't be State permitted law. by law yeah, right. is. I'm not really sure what the answer to that yeah. is. But I, I couldn't suggest that removing that part would be wise. I think it makes no, sense. No, I'm fine with that. I just I wasn't sure what it meant. Yeah. But knowing that it Grant was, wrote it, was it I'm fine with it. <laughs> yeah, it was sensitivity <laughs> to the to those to the two big communities because yeah. I was on the, you know that they wouldn't feel that they had lost any power in the. Yep in the board. Oh, I'm fine. I just Does don't this know. Nothing. Do we limit our board to 11? We establish that it's 11. Right. But do we limit it to no. 11? No, it can right. change. So starting at the top of A, it says consist of 11 members All elected right. for three-year terms. Then it talks about the initial. Yeah. I'm just wondering whether I mean, it, I guess it hasn't come up yet, but it, a board much bigger than 11 doesn't work very well. I thought and it said having, in here. And having an odd number is always handy. The board shall consist of 11 members. That seems very precise yeah. to 11. Yeah. Okay. And you know, it becomes tricky too, because we do guarantee later, I think, that Timbeth is guaranteed one. Yeah. And so based on the proportionality piece, you kind of default into the 11, right? right. Because Shrewsbury's double Tenmouth and Clarendon and Wallingford are double that um, with equal numbers. So you kind of just land there. Maybe that's, well, it, it, that's where the language for the, the last one that you questioned one it, came from. Yeah. And it, you know, in B, about the middle of the paragraph, it says, at no time will a town corresponding to a pre existing member school district have less than one board member. Yeah. So they yeah. didn't. you didn't even name it, which is good. <laughs> yeah. True. True. Yeah. No. I, I think that's it's still clear. Yeah. Okay. No other comments on. Uh... Um, does anybody do see? <laughs> Just as the curiosity. Over the property. I don't know. Yeah. Each outgoing that? member shall provide his or her replacement with all official property and documents of a continuous or consecutive nature. You know if that. I mean, should we bother with that in there? I mean, we don't have. We aren't issued laptops. We don't. Almost everything is online. It just seems sort of an unnecessary statement. Well, we don't have really official property. Cards, or in our name cards, right. that's all we have. Yeah. It I mean, used to be. Used to be that we did have. We had uh, envelopes. We had um, pulling pulling bath uh, um, pages and such. And we also all had a uh, a thing on uh, we had a policy, policy book. We had a policy book. Right. And we'd add to the parts, and then we were done. Policy book went to the next right. person coming on. Right, but that doesn't happen anymore because yeah. everything's online. Everything's online. I remember yeah. getting piles of paper that mm -hmm. I finally got rid of last year. Actually, <laughs> I got a box. We had to start yeah. the fire with something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Actually, it did go on a bonfire. <laughs> now that you mentioned it, but yeah. Well used. I don't know. I mean, it, it, it's sort of. I guess it doesn't hurt to have it in there. It just seems like an unnecessary. Well, I would. I like the idea of striking it. For the sole purpose of, I don't think it's the responsibility of the person leaving to give it to the person coming in. Right. And what are you going to give them? You know? um, I think it is more the, the board's, board's responsibility to have more of an initiation, yeah. initial I documentation. Mm -hmm. um, like I would support changing it that each new member would get something from the board to get them signed on, orientated. There you go. <laughs> like an orientation package of some sort. I, I would agree to that, but I don't think mm -hmm. it's agree to that. I don't know. I mean, I don't disagree with the idea. But I don't know if we put it in bylaws. I don't think we need to put it in the bylaws. Yeah. But it would be, I think it's something that we should explore further yeah. down the road. I agree. And if we, we do get it. something. We have. I, and I think Maria actually yeah. wrote something up. Yeah. Didn't you, Maria? Yeah. 
It looks like Sam probably used it. Yeah. <laughs> I used it's to like the red. Yes. <laughs> so. Yeah. I thought you sort of did an orientation packet. Yeah. I did. I do. And I, um, it needs, you know, regular review, but it's, it's helpful, I feel like. It you think so? Your people? It's I, helpful to me to refer to it myself. And I share the entire board periodically. Um, we have five minutes for this process, is that right? I just want to check in about that. No. In terms of time remaining? I'm not sure. Um, in terms of just the, uh, the time that the agenda has given to this. Um, Are you trying to move us along? Yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> Actually, no, we got be we've got we got 18 blunt. more. Be blunt. Okay. Um, so moving along. We actually have so we striking C? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, would we like C to be struck? I, I would. Sorry. I'm for it. Okay. Uh, letter E uh, bears attention. This yes, this absolutely. was a topic, um, if you recall, with George Ambrose's departure and Andrea Hawkins' election to the board. So mm -hmm. this current language does not align with what the statute says. Mm -hmm. um, I'd actually suggest we just try to figure out language that that speaks to the right statutory reference and I, I was about to suggest that 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 we have something in there that says the board will follow the law when a position becomes vacant yeah. agree with that all right since we don't have any option not to <laughs> right i'll uh i'll figure out some language to try to capture that if that's okay with yeah thank you uh there's one final piece in uh, number two and that is a vacancy in a district office so that would be a position like moderator right um, or the district director. clerk which is different than board clerk right Doug yeah. is our board clerk our district clerk is, is Crystal Usher mm -hmm. we actually do have a moderator vacancy because Grant was our moderator so that will be something we'll need to attend to before we get to annual town meeting time and our treasurer. Uh, so those three roles would be the, the ones referred to here. I mean, other than the citation, does that need any change in anybody's mind? Do we need to check that that's still correct? You might want to do that. Just check the citation. Yeah, I think yeah, that's yeah, what we said. Well, there's one up above. Nifty idea. Right, exactly. There's Cites one up above. it in the trunk. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or it's changed. I mean, it yeah. might still yeah. be the right one. I don't yeah. know. Because yeah. okay. they might have used the same number. Um, okay, is that as far as we were going to go today? Is we were going to do number three, but we can okay. stop if you'd like. What's your, what's your um, oh, what time is it? It is 8.24. Five minutes or 16 minutes ahead of schedule at the moment. Okay, then keep up. All right, so Roman numeral three is meetings and agenda. Yep. Um, this is the default place at the elementary schools. Other places approved meeting in each school at least once a year. Obviously, that's not been accurate in this COVID era, but that was certainly mm -hmm. our practice beforehand. And then just to show you what's left on here, just two other things. It spells out the meetings held twice a month, unless the board votes by two-thirds majority to meet more or less often. And then C uh, speaks to the process um, established in the open meeting law in terms of how agendas get constructed. So not a ton of content here. I don't. I mean, since we have not followed the meeting at the elementary schools, I, I would like to leave it in mm -hmm. there. But do we have? need to put something in of if if at all po if possible so that we aren't breaking the bylaws when we don't follow through on that even if it's a pandemic related so like if conditions allow or something like that I, that's what i was thinking as circumstances or conditions allow yeah i think that would be helpful but other than that i don't have anything anybody else i see no hands okay do we need to mention anything about hybrid because oh. even after pandemic, this mm. might be, this is a very equity way of getting a hold of community members and mm. people, our board members coming in. Does it mention at all how the meeting will be held? <coughs> in terms of virtual or? Yeah, it doesn't. And BJ, I would suggest we not go there. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if you think about it, we, we're following statute and the open meeting law by having this meeting this way, right? We're, we're creating yeah. access. I think as long as we adhere to the open meeting law, you utilize the flexibility that, that we have within that and not codify it in the bylaws because something could change about the open meeting law, you know, and, and we wouldn't yeah, want to. Mm -hmm. No, that's fine. Right. 
just wanted to bring it up. Yeah. I mean, the whole of A is a, is a little bit problematic because it, you know, the, the meeting dates and places will be published following the annual board reorganization meeting. Obviously, that time frame um, hasn't been happening. So. Yeah, my thinking on this one is meetings will be held at Mill River Union High School. Is that forcefully saying that technically we it will be here, or is it okay that part well, we of it's here? here? But it follows up with at Twice the elementary schools or other places as well. Right. So okay. Could do BJ's house if we wanted. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend it, but... <laughs> well, that's why you have to have someone here. Right, exactly. Yeah, so as long as it's... Berlin, where did you record that video a couple of years ago? His house, by the way. That's true. It wasn't a quorum. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but do we want to adjust that last that last sentence? A tentative schedule of meeting dates and places will be published. Yeah, the meet the dates are always published. You know. Um, right. Quickly, the places. But the places are not decided early on. So, like, would you request? Could we just get striking that? Well, just I mean, we could say a tentative schedule of meeting dates will be published following the annual meeting yep. and skip the places. That's easy. Okay. Is that okay with everybody? Sure. Okay. And unless you have any recommendations for B or C, uh -uh. your bylaw work for the evening is done. Cool. Thank you. Thank that you. was well like done. remarkable. Uh, committee business, and that means Glenn is up for personnel. Yes, um, we had a personnel committee this evening, personnel committee meeting this evening, and it mentions uh, contracts. We actually have no contracts to bring before the board for approval. Oh, that shows we've got all the people we need. No. Well, not quite, <laughs> and I'm going to let uh, Mr. Younts speak to that. There's, we get three things. There's usually board action requested. Um, FYI, for example, um, three teachers have notified uh, their wish for retirement at the end of this year. Two officially. No, three officially. Oh, three, three officially. Yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. That's all. That's a, just the number. Yep. yep. And underneath that is current postings. And under the current postings, one of the things that I noticed was special education para educators, we need 10 plus. So I asked David if he would be willing to speak to that. Yeah, and I appreciate the chance to do so. And Coral, just to give a heads up, I may defer to you after I potentially miss anything, okay? Um, yeah, that's fine. That's, that's Glenn asked the question, of what, what's the explanation behind that? Why do we have so many openings? And, and really there are a few layers in my mind. One is, the work of all of our paraeducators, let's be frank, the work of all of our support staff is really hard work. Uh, the way that those school and work days play out, the way that supporting students, sometimes individuals, sometimes groups of students, uh, the way a school day is navigated is challenging. The folks that we have in those roles are really, really committed to that work and they're really, really committed to the students, but it is tough work. Um, as a result, we do see turnover in those ranks that, that does occur. And, and I shared with the personnel committee earlier, you know, in a normal school year, non-pandemic, we probably have a, a rolling three or four paraeducator openings. But in a year like, like this year or last year, you know, we're in the double digits and, that, and that's tough. Another piece behind that is honestly finances. You know, so our, um, our employment circumstances with our support staff agreement in terms of the wage scale and what starting pay is, there are other jobs that folks can get out in the community that do pay more and are not as challenging. And that dynamic is tough for us. Um, just to give you some context in terms of how support staff pay scale is organized, it's based on level of education to an extent. So there's a, there's a column of wages based on if someone has a, a high school diploma if someone has an associate's degree, if someone has a bachelor's degree, and then we have a column if, if one of our support staff folks has a teaching license. And each of those columns has higher pay levels, but um, those, the, the first two columns in particular, uh, the high school and the associate's level, we don't have the capacity based on the way those are structured to sometimes pay people what they can get in other roles. So that creates a, 
an employee shortage that's being experienced all around the world and all around Vermont, but we feel it very acutely as well. Coral, I would, I would defer to you. Anything else you would uh, add to just describe um, reasons for shortages? Um, yeah, no, I, I think that you, you summed that up um, beautifully, Dave. Um, the other thing that I would just add, um, just on the student side, um, is that, you know, this, this pandemic has, has really intensified student needs in, in a number of ways, but in particular, the behavioral arena. Um, this is not news to any of you. You're reading about it all over the newspapers and the media. Um, we know that this pandemic has has intensified student needs, and that can be um, that can be very very difficult for staff to to keep up with that pace when they're already stressed out and, and dealing with their own situations. So, um, I will just say that that some of the needs that we are grappling with were were unknown to us and continue to evolve this year. Um, and that's that's really got us um, scrambling in, in some ways. And that includes students that are coming to us from other districts that, that we are um, billing those costs back to. Um, so we are, we're doing we're doing a lot of that work as well. So it's not necessarily just all you know, students that are residents here. But, yeah. Well, and I, I want to thank the parent educators because I know yeah. they're doing, <laughs> and, and, and yourself as well, well, I know other folks that thank you tonight, but, and, and it wasn't my intent to point it out in a negative way. I wanted to make sure <laughs> that, that folks understand why, because if you just look at the numbers, you kind of say, what does that yeah, mean? What's going on here? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I appreciate the input, and, and that's all I was looking for, really, and thank you. Um, no. Next meeting is January 5th, 2022. How about at, that? At 6 o'clock. Everyone could gasp now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's it for me. Okay. Policy. BJ. Policy. I have some policies to approve. Excited about this. Okay, so I'm going to move to approve D18 travel reimbursement. Do I have a motion? Len? You made the motion, right? I made the motion, so last I'll second. second. I'll, I'll go through it. All in favor? Or raise your hand. Put it on screen. Yep. Okay. Help me keep an eye behind me, yep, please. We'll try. <laughs> any against? No. Any abstentions? I don't see anything. Okay, so that's 18 is approved. Next, uh, move to approve policy E14, capitalization of assets. Thank you, Len. Second. All in favor? Okay. Any against? Any abstentions? I don't hear any, so approved. Okay, I move to approve a policy. We were busy. <laughs> I move to approve a policy D20, prevention of conflict of interest in procurement. Uh, anybody want to second this one? Sure. <laughs> I got Len. Okay, all in favor? Good. Any against? Any abstentions? Okay, sound looks approved. Okay, one more. I move to approve the policy F1, school community behavioral expectations. Ooh, do I have a second? Use a second. Ben. Okay, lens a second. Discussion or uh, discussion? I forgot, forgot the discussion points. Okay, um, all in favor? Okay. Any against? Nope. Any abstentions? Not that I can see. Thank you. And our next meeting is December 14th at 5.30. So, here in this room. Thank you. I'm all good. Good. Work. good. Thanks, BJ. Personnel will be in here, too. But <laughs> oh, good point. That. Um, buildings and grounds, do you have a report to uh, Not really. We haven't been doing the meetings and stuff. And then we had a, a uh, 
Committee for Financials, and it really it started hitting both shoulders. Um, the uh, repairs we're doing to the former central office building and the, the costs that are going to be coming forward with that seem to be very, very huge. Um, I want to have a talk with Gary about that. So I'm either going to have a meeting coming up on, I think it's the 7th, which is next week, Tuesday, or the uh, 14th, which are we doing a 15th uh, December meeting yet? Do we we're talk about that? That might be the way to hold that off until then and get some more information on that. So We're going to be talking about it in the finance report, yeah. too. Good. There's a motion coming to that regard that Gary and Stan can speak to as well. Yes. Yeah. Good. Uh, other than that, we're, uh, we're still doing pretty good. I don't believe we've got our buses yet, but uh, still looking at those uh, <laughs> empty spot back there to, uh, to put a nice bus in, but uh, we'll see how it happens. Okay, thank you. And then we'll move on. Um, community engagement, Maria. Thank you. Um, at this point, we haven't had a meeting since I last reported um, at the previous meeting, but our next meeting will take place at the river on, okay, my calendar right here, on December 14th at 6.30, so after policy. Um, our next community conversation is on the 20th. And the, the board members who, at this point, will be present are Bjorn, myself, and Sam Green. Does that sound doable for all three of you? Oh, yes, to me. Um, the date is that we're pretty good? The 20th? Yep, at 6.30. And that will be, I mean, it will be virtual via a Google Meet. And um, we'll be putting out an invitation for that the week before. And again, for, you know, as I do at every meeting, I want to encourage community members to take part in that because it is really, it's been a rewarding experience every time I've taken part in it. Um, I find that people show up to that who do not all agree with me and for certain have not all voted for me, but I feel like it's an important chance for me to talk with people and hear about what community members have as concerns and as questions and maybe things that we're not being entirely transparent or clear about that we need to be aware of and not that we're not being transparent because we have some malicious intent but because we don't realize that people care about certain things and we sort of just sort of carry on with them regardless i think that um, this is a great time if people don't understand why the board made a decision about a certain thing. This is an opportunity for you to come and say, what's going on? Why did you say that? Um, sometimes people bring things to community to, to public comment that are, that are really legitimate concerns, and this is a really great place to talk to us about them. Um, for example, if you have a specific question for a school board member, who makes the decision to behave in a certain way, you can say, for example, Maria, why why don't you take part in the play? For example, um, there's lots of other things you can ask us about, but those are opportunities to talk to us one-on-one -on -one or about decisions that we've made. So I would really appreciate any community member, um, be you, some who pays taxes in the district, a parent, a school employee, feel free to come to the community conversation because they can be really great. And um, I would like to thank our board members who have signed up to for community conversations in 2022. Oh. Sam, Len, Andrea, and Bruce, and the rest of you, I will continue to send you emails and tell you <laughs> Thank you, Maria. <laughs> I was waiting for you that part of it. I was going to say, don't you want to remind yeah, us? <laughs> yeah, I, I got it. Yeah, okay. All right. Um, negotiations, we, we um, are still, oh, go ahead. It'd be nice, uh, Maria, we could uh, include our uh, new student members in that sometimes? Oh, 100%. Ooh. That would be a great thing for you to take part in. Yeah, um, one at a time. It'd be good to, to get some experience there. That. that was great. She'll send you a sign up too. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, negotiations. We don't have a whole lot of, of I mean, I don't have an, any real update. We're still um, 
continuing to negotiate with the, the um, Teachers Association and we are waiting for the support staff um, negotiating group to get back to us on, on um, a date that will work for our first meeting for them because their contract has to be renegotiated um, now too. And that's all. So finance. Liz. Hi everybody. So I'm going to start with the approval of pay orders and payroll. I'm going to start with pay orders from the general fund. We have a pay order in the amount of $53,000. $961.53. Also from the general fund, we have a pay order in the amount of $10,172.89. From our after school program, we have a pay order in the amount of $338.32. And from our food program, we have a pay order in the amount of $56,904.53. For a grand total of one hundred and twenty-one thousand three hundred and seventy-seven dollars and twenty-seven cents. From our student activity fund, we have a pay order from Mill River in the amount of three thousand seven hundred and fifty-three dollars and thirty-six cents. From Clarendon Elementary, we have a pay order in the amount of sixty dollars and thirty-nine cents. From Tintnet, we have a pay order in the amount of $133.53 for a total of $3,947.28. For payroll this evening, we have regular payroll dated November 19th in the amount of $601,008.54. And I make the motion that we, I'm sorry, am I making, am I stating the question? Yes. I think that works best, and you. I won't say a thing. Okay. Go ahead. All right. So I would like to make the motion that my fellow board members accept and approve these pay orders and this payroll as presented. So, <laughs> so moves. We're all second. Okay. BJ seconded. All right. All in favor. And I, so I'm going to change my view and see everybody. I think I can see everybody. I can't see everybody there because you're too small. So okay, everybody on, on everybody on camera voted yes. Everybody here voted yes. Great. Thank you so much. Yep. Um, so I have the RSSU building proposal that um, would stand to present that. I believe the the motion um, is for you, Liz, but Stan and Gary, I think, are both still with us, um, can speak to the nuts and bolts of it. It probably makes sense okay. to make the motion, get the second, and then get to discussion so that the, the group can talk about it. Okay. All right. So I'll start with that. Um, so whereas the funding sources that I will see in just a moment are intended to be utilized for the following purposes for the purpose of renovations to the former rsu office building as necessary to serve as the home for the foundation program from the esther 2 grant two hundred and fifty six thousand nine hundred and thirty nine dollars from the 2018 bond fund fourteen thousand thirty three dollars and seventy three cents from the general fund, $45,000. From the building sinking fund, $284,027.27. For a total of $600,000, I move that the board approve expenditures of up to $600,000 for phase two value engineering and construction work for the former RSSU office building through the existing project management group EEI for these purposes. The construction manager, facilities department, and the business office are to work with the special education director in order to value engineer a quality project meeting the program needs within the stipulated financial limitations. Additional board approval will be required for any costs 
over and above this approved amount should the value engineering identify components whose additional costs can be justified as providing beneficial impact to the district. So any discussion? No, it needs to be seconded. Um, yeah. Have you heard a second yet? I'll second it. Thank you, Sam. I was going to say, I think I heard someone. Thank okay. you. Yep. Um, do we want Gary to give us a run through? Yeah. Um, excuse me. If you remember from our one of our previous meetings, we had authorized um, the group DEI to cut down our performance contract for us to proceed with some preliminary design work associated with the renovations of the building in question. They, they took a look at minimum costs from a code and safety standpoint to get us in the building. That project would run in the vicinity of $450,000. Um, the other extreme, if you will, to give us everything that we would need within the building and to meet, if you will, the wish list of the program um, would, would be the uh, on the other extreme of 800 some odd thousand dollars. I think it was 880,000 dollars if I remember the number correctly. So in, in talking with Stan and the design team and, and with Coral about specific needs for that program, we feel like we can value engineer our way into a project in the $600,000 range that will meet Coral's needs and goals for that program and give us a good 20-year building that we can basically market to others, if you will. Um, so that's that's where we are at this point. We're trying to get approval to proceed with a not to, not to exceed value of $600,000. Um, but if we find ourselves in a position through value engineering, let's use an example of a $620,000 project would give us this added push that we need. We would come back to the board looking for that additional approval for that $20,000 extra. But at this point, we're seeking the $600,000, believing we can obtain what the program needs for that value. Is this the Dan, anything that you wanted to add to that? Uh, the only thing I want to add is in regards to the you know the funding sources that we recommend to use to get to that six hundred thousand dollar number. Uh, none of those numbers will have any kind of uh, uh, impact that would affect any program, school program in the district in a negative way. Um, the extra two grant, the funds that we had left over with the you know the current extra two grant that we have. The behind us proceeds that are left over from projects that have been completed. Uh, general fund budget 45,000 that comes out of the district capital maintenance line that we have in the general fund budget. And the building sinking fund, if we use 284,000 of that, of that fund, we will still have uh, $280,000 remaining in that district building sinking fund. Okay, I'll open it up for questions. Wait, he's still talking. He is. Stan, you oh. muted yourself. Is there? Oh, no, I'm, I'm good. That's all I wanted to say. <laughs> oh, okay. You were still talking and we didn't know. He's still over there. Oh, maybe I'm, del I'm on delay then. Yeah, there's oh. some latency there. Okay. <laughs> that was weird. That was weird. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, does anybody have questions for yeah, Stan I was just, or Gary? Um, do we have like plans we can look at here? Because I'm thinking that little building you could build like three of them for six hundred thousand dollars is what my personal thing is so i'd love to see how that money is being spent or what that what that looks like what does six hundred thousand dollars look like here yeah uh, why don't you explain all those efforts <laughs> um one of the um very um expensive components if you will of that the project is actually asbestos abatement um, if, as you can imagine, due to the age of that building, um, with the upper range project, there is close to $110,000 of asbestos abatement associated with that, that project. Um, the building itself has what we call very good bones. It, it, it's an excellent shape structurally, but there are a lot of needs from a safety and code standpoint that, that are required. Um, 
I, I don't think that we would be able to build from scratch anything of this nature that would be compatible or comparable to what we will end up with the project uh, there for the same dollar value. Um, and you know, as opposed to when we originally had some conversations about renovating that building into office space, I, I still maintain that it doesn't make sense for a project of that nature when we have office space available to us, if you will, at the high school because of the vacancies that we have there. Um, but for a program such as Coral's program where we are looking for a separate building, I think the renovations here make, make excellent sense. We would be um, reconfiguring some of the interior, but not much. We would be having to put in an ADA bathroom, uh, ADA ramp, um, a second means of egress, fire alarm systems. Um, we would also be looking at making the building energy efficient with uh, additional insulation, um, LED lighting, such as we've done in all of our other buildings. So those type of, um, that type of a project does start to add up after a while. We don't, DJ, we don't have final plans for the project yet because part of the conversation about value engineering is, is getting to the point of deciding which components are really worth the additional money. So we, we have a basic layout that we've developed for the building. Um, the interior, if you can remember what it looks like, it really has not changed that much. We have eliminated one of the small offices, but are really maintaining those two larger areas as large classrooms. Uh, we would be putting in some kitchen facilities um, so that um, some life skills can be learned associated with cooking and washers and dryers and that type of thing. We will be installing air conditioning um, so that we can use the building throughout the summer. So pretty, pretty, um, pretty advanced uh, renovations to the building, indeed, but um, well worth it, I believe. Um, and BJ, this is Coral. I'm just going to add to um, just offer a reminder that one of the options that we did explore pretty carefully for this program was an investment towards the purchase of a new um, sort of modular classroom setup. Um, that option, though, after some careful exploration, was pretty quickly taken off the list as, as being viable to us for a number of reasons. Um, one of those reasons being that those modular uh, situations, they, they do not accommodate expansion over time. You, we would not be able to expand this program really at all beyond whatever nuts and bolts we get from a modular. The other thing is that my understanding from talking with some contractors and consulting with Gary, um, pricing of those modular buildings for what we would need is pretty pretty skyrocketed uh, right now and probably going to go a heck of a lot higher before this pandemic is over. Um, and with the contractors I spoke with, good luck getting one within the next three years. <laughs> um, so we are on a timeline. So there were a number of reasons why a modular was was taken right off the list pretty quickly. But I just want to remind that, that that option was explored and the price differential is is not really worth it. So. Okay. Gary, I have a question. This is Adrian. What's the time frame for, you know, if we pass this tonight, um, what's the time frame for all of this work? I mean, it's extensive work. I'm not expecting it, you know, next week. But. Yeah. The work is fairly extensive, um, but we could not realistically start tomorrow, but the day after tomorrow possibly, we could actually be started with the project. The goal is to have that building occupiable by the start of the academic year next year. So we would be working the rest of this winter season over the summer and have it ready to go by the start of the academic year. And I don't know, Coral or Gary, how many how many kids are we currently expecting to serve in that space? Uh, well, right at the moment, we are projecting that we're going to be starting with 14. Um, that's my roughest estimate, but um, I am starting to receive some calls about students from other districts 
potentially coming into this program on tuition, and I can't really I can't really commit to accommodating that until I until I know which direction the board is going to take on this. But we're projecting starting out with 14, and that's uh, that's quite an increase. I haven't let this program capacity go over nine since I started it. I haven't I haven't let us go over that nine. So the 14 is is actually upward on that threshold. What do you hope the capacity will be once these renovations are done? Well, there's what I hope for it to be, and then there's what I'm told it well, can be. Well, based uh, on the renovation plan, the, the preliminary plan. The occupancy is 65, which seems very high to me for that building. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you two figures. The occupancy is 65. That's obviously, that's like running your own school at that point. But, um, I could foresee an occupancy eventually in there of even 25, which would not surprise me at all knowing sort of where we're going with social, emotional, and behavioral needs of, of kids, so. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The other thing I'll add, you know, I don't know, if, I don't know that folks are aware or not, but we would be sending these particular students out of district at anywhere from 65 to $90,000 a year um, in tuition. So, so I will just say, uh, you know, if, if not for a program like this, then you're either going to pay now or you're going to pay later and you're going to pay much more later. Take your word for it. <laughs> um, so I, I just want to point out that when you look at those costs and look at the rising costs of tuition that are now impacting all of you know your independent schools and smaller programs. Um, you you want to make sure you got a program in house to to deal with this long term, for sure. I, I, I really applaud all the work that's been done because there's there's not enough programs out there. They're very expensive, and we could be very helpful to this area with yeah. having with having this program, you know, in a in a suitable building with with proper staffing, and and I think it could. We could really be uh, value to to the rest of the county and, and maybe even some of the surrounding counties. And I also think, you know, just to emphasize the point, I think that as we talk about inclusivity and equity, you know, we are talking about a historically very disadvantaged population of children that we are able to keep here, that we are able to love and, and take care of as our own, and that's what we're in the business to be doing. Um, so these. These kids deserve that that commitment. Thanks, Bro. I don't know, Liz, if you're if you're willing to to call the question, or would you like me to I, do that? Yeah, go ahead, Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> if there's no other comments, I would. Um, I guess I would make a motion to to. I, I'm not sure what the. Do we have the vote? We have, we have to vote on a second. What? She made the motion and we have a second. Actually. We just have to vote. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I guess we'll just vote. Thank you. Um, all in favor of, of the the motion that, that Liz had read out because it was really long and extensive. <laughs> okay. Please raise your hand. Looks unanimous. Okay. It, it appears to be unanimous. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yes. Okay. So, and I want to thank Coral because this is really an incredible program and you've been just a really strong advocate for in our district, so thank you. And before I let folks go, as part of the committee business, I do have an update, if I may, on the FY23 budget. Um, so the Finance Committee has been meeting weekly with district administration to discuss, plan, and develop the fiscal year 23 budget. We are preparing to present the FY23 budget to the board at the December 15th meeting for your approval, hopefully in January. Factors impacting the FY23 budget include Act 173 funding changes that shift reimbursement for special services to a block grant model, resulting in a reduction of funds available to the district for these purposes. Reduced student enrollment, which is both a statewide and local pattern dating back to the early 2000s. Entry in place to a reduction of funds available to the district from the state education fund. And lastly, fewer tuition revenue students. 
Rolling over our current budget to next year would result in a modest expenditure increase of 2.56%, but would result in a projected tax rate increase of over 10%. The committee deems this unacceptable and as it is too significant and unreasonable. Rather, the committee has targeted $1 million in reductions in order to contain any tax increase to between two and three percent. The following areas are being considered as areas of reduction to mitigate tax rate increases. Organization and reduction of building-based and central office administrative roles, attrition and reduction in support staff roles throughout the district, attrition and reduction in teaching positions throughout the district, reduction in technology and professional development spending, and reductions in transport transportation program offerings. Each of these considerations is carefully analyzed by the committee and includes quantitative and qualitative input from our district leaders in order that impact on students, families, programs, and taxpayers be fully considered and weighed. And there's good news. There is a surplus of almost $90 million in the state education fund left over from fiscal year 22. The governor and administration are returning half of this surplus or $45 million to property taxpayers. The forecasted FY23 homestead yield announced today is $13,846 compared to $11,317 for fiscal year 22, which is the current property year, current property tax year. The forecasted FY23 income yield is $16,705 compared to $13,770 for FY22. The average homestead tax rate is forecasted to decrease by 21.4 cents compared to FY22. The statewide base non-homestead tax rate is forecasted to decrease by 22.7 cents. In the Mill River District, we are on track for a 24.77 cent homestead decrease from $1.5543 to $1.3066. It is my pleasure to announce this evening that in light of the education fund surplus, the homestead and income tax yields announced today, together with our budgeting strategies and priorities, that we in the Mill River District are on track for a 15.94% tax decrease. I want to thank the members of the Finance Committee and members of the administrative team for their hard work and time commitment these last few weeks in planning the FY23 budget. The next meeting of the Finance Committee is Monday, December 6th at 5 p.m. and we are meeting via Google Meet virtually. And that's all I have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Liz. Very interesting information. Um, Moving on to the ad hoc committees. Um, I don't think Matt had to leave, so Lynn, you're up, or whoever's yep. reporting from here. Um, the ad hoc student retention committee, um, we had a meeting scheduled on November 23rd, but we did not have a quorum, so therefore we did not have a meeting. Uh, the next meeting is December 7th, um, from 5.30 to 6.30, that will be a virtual meeting. And again, at this point, what we're trying to look at are what kind of questions we may be asking folks to get answers in terms of retention. And also looking at um, an exit, not an exit survey, but a survey provided at the end of each year to community members, parents, to get an idea of um, how the year went. That actually <coughs> was included in our board goals. Right. So, 
Um, but that's where we're at. Next meeting, December 7th, 5.30 to 6.30, virtual. And I think I have sent out invitations already. Um, and I think, Ann, you've posted the agenda for that ad hoc. Yeah. So we're good to go. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, we are on to transacting other legal business. Um, the, the thing that's written in there is board meetings at elementary schools. I don't know how we all feel since we have sort of um, decided on, on a hybrid meeting format. I'm not sure how we can translate that to going to the elementary schools. Sorry. No. I, 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 I to, don't know if anyone has, has any suggestions. Yeah, could we could do a field trip from us? There two or three people, you get on the computer, you, you bring yourself in, you talk with, I, I think the, uh, the schools and the districts like to have their kids come up and perform. That, that we always have something when we went to those. I don't know if we can do that realistically yeah. with COVID, Doug. Could be tough, could be tough. Well, I think it might be impossible. Maria's gonna hand up. Oh, Maria, go ahead. Thanks, um, yeah, I think that this might be something that we should table for the rest of until we have a clear picture of where we're headed. And also, I do appreciate seeing students, but I don't want to lay having to prepare for an evening event, even if we could bring people together in a space. I don't want to lay that on teachers right now. I feel like they have quite enough on their plates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we can we can readdress this in a couple months and see yeah. whether things have lightened up, um, you know, whether people feel comfortable having having an in-person meeting, which is what it would take. Mm -hmm. for us to do that but until winter's over um you know maybe maybe come spring when everything can be open and and airing out or maybe there'll be some miraculous change in the pandemic and we'll all feel more comfortable in the same room so um the other thing is can can that and can you put that in the i'm sorry go ahead. Can, i just want to make sure that's in the minutes that we will we'll look at revisit it, again. it yeah again I'm going to yeah. say revisit it when we feel a little bit more safer about the you know, right si this situation. Yeah. Um, the other thing that we had talked about or that I had added to the agenda was to discuss finishing up our goals work. Um, if you want, we can put that off until the beginning of, of January and, and do it at a first meeting or we could take a little bit of the next meeting and do it then. What's your pleasure, folks? I don't even know. Liz disappeared, so I don't have her um, expertise. I was trying to find all the all the schedules to see how much we have left, but I know we have at least one more session of working through the goals. At least, yeah. can we? Yeah. What about like doing a six o'clock one, the opposite meeting that we have personnel? Could do that. That would be that would work. Just a dedicated one hour <coughs> to it. Um, but we'd have a meeting on the 15th, right? A personnel meeting? Didn't you Not say the 15th? Not a personnel, no. Oh, who board. was on the 15th? Just regular board. Just regular? Okay, yeah. I thought somebody else had added something on to the 15th. We could do that. If, if everybody's comfortable meeting at, at 6 o'clock instead of 7 for the next meeting and, and try and work through the rest of, or at least That's make a step. That's December 15th. December 15th. Um, could I have a show of hands? That That's okay, we'll do that. Okay, that that will be done. I don't have anything else. Does anybody else have anything they want to bring up? Not for the next board meeting, but a reminder to the board, and I'll send this to you via um, email. Monday the 13th, we have a joint training Correct. with the board and the leadership team. So that's the principals and central office administrators uh, with Dr. Brown. Um, that's a 4.30 to 6.30 location somewhere in this building to be determined. <laughs> but I'll, uh, I'll uh, send that by email just to remind you. Okay, thank you. So I guess we move into agenda building. Um, Stan raised his hand. Oh, Stan, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, I just wanted to follow up with something in regards to what Liz was talking about, the tax rates, so that the board and the public uh, fully understand you know, what, where we are as of today. Um, what we, the information we got today was a property yield number, and that's just one third of the component that goes into the calculating the tax rate. So, you know, based on the information we had, you know, the tax rate would decrease 15%, but there's two other components, the equalized pupil number and the common level of appraisal number 
that are still unknown. And you know, what the tax commissioner had said today, more than likely with the common level of appraisal number, which is based on real estate sales, uh, that number is going to affect the tax rate in a negative way and cause it to go the, you know, the other way. So we don't know that information as of the moment. We won't know that probably until sometime after mid-December. I just wanted to make clear of that, that that is not going to be the decrease. Um, you know, when was the final budget is completed? Thank you for bursting that bubble, Stan. <laughs> we appreciate it. But it's good to hear reality. <laughs> And we'll be getting those numbers soon, and, and um, the CLAs are for each for each town, so as the state works through that, um, we'll all hear what, what those numbers are going to be. So I guess we're back to agenda building. I don't see anybody else raising their hand. Does um, anybody have something they want on the agenda? For under next? committee business, I'm assuming we might want to start adding some, the student report back in. Sure. Which... Honestly, it was just how things, how, your opinion of how things were going. Last yeah, you don't have it. to do, we, we just like to hear what's going on in the school because <laughs> most of us, I don't know, most of us don't have kids in, at Mill River anymore. My kids all graduated and, and are gone, so I don't have that student voice in my ear saying, Mom, fix this. <laughs> so, so you guys are the voice of the student body. Keep that in mind. Okay, thank you. That's a good idea. Anything else, people? Anybody virtual? Okay. Um, we do have um, a, a quick executive session. Um, and I'm not quite sure how we do that with all of all of the people here. Um, maybe, I think that would be... Maybe the board over. goes to another location? Yeah, that might be easiest. Just because we got the camera. Because we will right come down. back just to adjourn, but I don't think there will be anything there to There be another meet for the virtual people for them to join oh Dave yeah um, <laughs> that's an interesting question can you not just have people leave the room for the period I think we time? might have go to, to the library or go somewhere like that yeah I'm sorry guys we have to kick everybody else out of this, yeah. this meeting too it would um, I don't know student reps they're not official members I, I don't yet. think it would be appropriate to have them be a part of this conversation no. No. Maybe give when us you, a separate meet and have people in the room go someplace else. Yeah. So if you guys would all exit the well, we have to we have to actually um, name it. Join. I mean, make a motion to go into the session. Are you going home? Oh, absolutely. I'm sorry, guys. You don't have to wait for us to adjourn. <laughs> um, we do have to to to, to make a motion to go in executive session and do all the the proper. Is walking away with my language. Yeah. 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 I'm sorry, Sam, I missed what you said. Uh, just remind me that we're not executive, as it were, virtually yet. Right. Still yep, yeah. absolutely. We actually still have to make a motion to go into executive session. So, I, I mean, moved or seconded, or what would you like? Okay. I, oh, we got to do the wording. <laughs> yep. Although we lost I would the like to make a motion to have an executive session because premature public general knowledge would clearly place the board and the individuals involved at a substantial disadvantage. I will second that. Thank you, Sam. And then we have a second motion. Are you keeping no, we track need to of vote. that, Dave? Oh, yes. Okay. So then we need to vote. Okay. Um, all in favor, please raise your hand. Okay, thank you. That's unanimous. And now we have to vote. Uh, we have to have a motion to actually go into executive session. So I'd make, go ahead. Yeah, I move that we move into executive session. At I'll second that. At 916. 916. So here's my dilemma in this moment. Okay. Even Hold on, let's vote. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, are we all voting? Do in favor? Go into executive session? Okay, thank you, that was unanimous.